Bram here, back with some Grand Tactician Civil War, the CSA campaign. Did do a little bit of stuff off camera. Um, we are still researching. It's not really researching as much as just kind of all the political work, the debate in the legislature and drafting of the bill and everything. But we're still working on uh, Military 2, which is about two and a half weeks away in game time still. So that should be, what is that, 18 days, it's the 10th. So just after Christmas, we will have that policy unlocked, which will give us some more volunteers um, by increasing our recruitment subsidy. And that will give us the Army Corps structure. So what I've done is, looking ahead to that, I have made some command changes in the armies. So, and basically I've called some senior officers back to Montgomery for consultations with the president. And <laughs> preparatory to them taking their Army commands. Uh, the bottom line, there is going to be an, an Army HQ in Northern Virginia. There will be an Army HQ in Western Virginia. There will be an Army HQ in the Tennessee, Kentucky area at Nashville, or starting at Nashville. And there will be an Army HQ across the Mississippi, spe specifically Missouri, kind of in this area. <clears throat> and so I have freed up the generals who I intend to take those army commands, most of whom were already in army command. And so now if I go to officers and I filter for the unassigned officers, so these are all the guys who don't have any commands anywhere. And we've got Robert E. Lee, he's going to be in Virginia. Sterling Price, who has been commanding the Missouri Army, and uh, he will continue when he goes back in a more senior level, but he, for the moment he is unassigned. Albert Sidney Johnston will command the Western Theater, the Near Western Theater in Tennessee, Kentucky, as he has been. And I'm going to use uh, Beauregard for the Western Virginia Army Command. And so I've relieved them all from their current... Lee wasn't assigned, but these three were. So I've relieved these guys from their Army Commands and promoted other officers in their place. The big loser in all this is uh, in this game of musical chairs is uh, Joseph Johnston, who was commanding the Shenandoah Army. And I replaced him, but I don't immediately have a plan for him. He's going to probably wind up being a future Corps commander. Um, so, Joe Johnston kind of loses out there. Which has a certain kind of historical ring to it. <laughs> uh, I also replaced Garnet in the Western Virginia Army. Not a bad general, but I just... Yeah, I had a better one, so I replaced him as well. So who is in command of these armies? So the Northern Virginia Army, which is currently at Washington, D.C., will soon become the first corps of the ANV. That's under Longstreet. You know, he's got a total of 11 stars combined among his four attributes, uh, attributes and also three fame. Stonewall Jackson in charge of the Shenandoah Army, which will soon become the Second Corps. And he's uh, almost, he's about like uh, Longstreet, a total of 11 stars, three stars of fame. I promoted Marmaduke to command of the Missouri Army, which will soon be the One Corps in in. Price's upcoming Missouri Army. And here I go on one of my little 
historical tangents. Before playing this campaign, I, I confess I had never really heard of this general. I'm, I confess that my knowledge of the, the Western theater in this war historically, and particularly across the river, the Trans-Mississippi region, uh, isn't what it is for, say, the Virginia theater. Wh which I think that's true of many, many people who read up on this stuff. So I've never really heard of this guy. Um, it, what was kind of interesting, and all I, you know, I'm not an expert. I just read the Wikipedia article, you know, like anybody can do. Uh, but what, was, what I found interesting about him is he's he's shown as a West Point graduate, which he was. Uh, he had gone, you know, he graduated from West Point, and he was an active serving officer in the United States Army at the time that the war started. So this is accurate. Um, but they could have, in this game, they could also have given him the political officer... Um, icon as well quite easily and there are a couple of generals in the game where they have done that so I, i'm almost surprised they didn't because he came from a very political family and uh, was involved in politics a lot uh, in his life his great-grandfather had been governor of kentucky his father had been governor of missouri his uncle on his mother's side, I think, because a different last name, was currently the governor of Missouri at the start of the war. Um, interestingly, his father, the former governor, was very pro-union, whereas his uncle, the current governor, was very pro-secession. <laughs> so even within one family, there was a... Uh, some division of opinion in Missouri. And Marmaduke himself, later, after the war, would become governor of Missouri. So yeah, they could have made him a political officer, in addition to being West Point. And, and while he was regular army, or had been regular army, and, uh, and so, you know, that's why he was in uniform in the Confederacy. But uh, you know, his, his career... And kind of the postings he got and some of the consideration he got, yeah, clearly, well, maybe not so clearly to anybody, but I kind of read that there was some political influence to the kinds of jobs he got as well. Um, as far as I could tell from the little article I read, it didn't particularly stand out as a exceptional general, but nor did it look like he was a particularly below average general either. So, you know, kind of a solid commander, although not a, a, a standout commander. It was just the impression I read. I'm sure if I read more, I'd, I'd you know, there's more detail there. But, um, so that's the history of Marmaduke. And he did largely he, he all of his service was in the west and most of that service was in the trans mississippi west in the arkansas louisiana missouri areas and that's you know frankly that's why i hadn't really registered him before historically so it seemed appropriate to keep him uh, you know, I had talked about uh, maybe make him a, making him a new corps commander when I formed a new one, wherever it went. Uh, but it seemed appropriate to keep him over here in the Trans-Mississippi. So Marmaduke in charge of the Missouri soon-to-be corps. And then the other uh, change I made was Edward Johnson, Allegheny Johnson, had also increased a lot in stats over in the Missouri Army as well. He was a Brigadier General, he's a West Pointer, so I decided to promote him and I gave him the West Virginia Army, which will soon be the, I said West, 
the Western Virginia. I'm going to rename this army to something else. <laughs> uh, in place of Garnet. I thought that because I was only promoting him one rank and he's a West Pointer, that he wouldn't lose a lot of stats. But in this case, boom, he got hit pretty hard. Uh, he's got a total of, what is that, eight stars in these four attributes. I, I count, these, I count fame is a little bit different because that kind of comes from a different source, I guess. I don't know why I do that. Well, he was 11 stars as a brigadier general in command of a division over in Missouri. And when I put him in command of this corps, boom, he, he lost three stars in here. I think he took a hit on initiative and a hit on administration and a hit on cunning. So I was a little disappointed to see that. But he's a major general now. Um, and I think he's still a little bit better than Garnet, so I'm leaving him here. And I can't drop him back down to a divisional command now anyway. I don't think I can. So here he is, having dropped a bit in his capacity. But he's still pretty good. I think he'll be fine working for Beauregard. And then finally, yeah, I, I uh, Hardy was pretty good, but he did the same thing. I think he lost a star or two as well, but he looked really good. He was in command of the cavalry in the Army of Tennessee. So when I, uh, so I replaced Albert Sidney Johnston with Hardy in command of this force, and I promoted. Uh, Henry McCulloch in command of this cavalry over here. That's just the engineers, no change here. And then finally we've got down in Montgomery, this is kind of the recruiting force. Um, Bragg will keep this, but then I will place an army command over this as well at Montgomery, which will be commanded by Samuel Cooper, which I think I already talked about Cooper in a previous episode. Not a lot of information about this guy, but his rent, he's actually senior. He was the senior most Confederate general. Senior to Lee, senior to Albert Sidney Johnston, senior to everybody. But he stayed in Richmond the entire war in kind of an administrative position, kind of like a Winfield Scott. And just and seems to have seems to have been well thought of, and he remained in that position for the entire war. So there has to be more to know about this guy, and I, I just don't know it. Anyway, so that is uh, what I have done off camera, and let's get time rolling and see where the Federals decide to attack us in the dead of winter, trashing their readiness uh, next. <laughs> Okay, one fort is done. Oh, here we go. Another another fight at uh, uh, St. Louis. Army of the Mississippi is back. Oh, and this time he's reinforced by the Army of Kentucky. So we're going to have a total of about 30,000 men on the Union side this time compared to our 18,000. All right, Marmaduke, here's your first uh, experience in overall command. I think you can get the better of Halleck. He's got a lot of calves, 6,000 calves, so it's probably, well, that would have to be at least three brigades, I would think. And at least eight brigades of infantry. All right. Let's take a quick look at the uh Yeah.
This is my favorite load screen photograph in this game. Those aren't reenactors, those are just that's an actual photograph from the time. Colorized, of course. Like they all are. It's just guys kind of just goofing off doing silly stuff in camp. <laughs> Okay, this says initially 14,000 men under Halleck, but we know that the, uh, I think the reinforcement time was zero hours for, uh, Army of the Mississippi to arrive on the field. Okay, meeting situation. But we have ownership of the objective. Halleck, at least, is starting at one of these two spots. Either way, he's pretty much got to come... Well, no, he doesn't. From over here, his obvious route is to come down Copperton Road to Copperton and then approach the objective along this route, in which case we've got a nice river here for a defensive position. However, if he starts here, his route is across Mason Hill to the Lee place and then come at it from this direction. So that's an issue. And then the second issue is the Army of the Mississippi isn't necessarily, even though it shows zero hours, they're not actually on the field yet. They're just going to come very quickly as soon as time starts rolling. And Fremont, if Fremont is still in command of that army, which we can actually see, is Fremont still in command of that army? He is. Okay. <clears throat> Fremont is not necessarily restricted to one of these two points. He could come here, right by the Lee place. That would be problematic for us. He could also come here over by the Stewart uh, farm. That would be okay. He can't flank us across the bay and the swamp. So I'm not worried about that point. But I am worried about this one. So I'm initially going to put Cav over here. Whatever else I do, I'm, I'm initially going to put cavalry, cavalry here and grab that point real fast to hopefully ensure that Fremont doesn't enter in a spot that is a problem for us. That still leaves the... 50-50 chance that Halleck will be coming down this route or this one and obviously I can't readily cover both. Let's see what the terrain is like facing toward the Lee place. Frankly not all that great. I mean, it's, it's not great for attacking either because it's open for, for him. You know, if, if he comes down here and comes down around this road, it's, it's wide open. So that's not great for attacking, but I don't really have good terrain here for, I mean, I can put up some defensive works, which I have points to do. So we'll have some trenches or breastworks or something in this area. 
But what I don't have is good terrain upon which to anchor that defense and complicate the enemy's problem for a flank attack by making him go through woods and over creeks or what have you. And I think of it in terms of like hard anchor and soft anchor. A hard anchor would be like if I could uh, end, like for example, right here. If I threw a line of entrenchments across this area, on the left, this would be a soft anchor. Those woods do not prevent an effective flank attack. It just slows it down. And uh, it, de it will develop a little bit slower and there will be increased cohesion and fatigue on the enemy units coming at the flank from this direction. On the other side, you've got this river, the Hoedown, <laughs> the Hoedown River, and it is wider than a regular creek, and uh, is it, it's not impassable, but it's even slower um, and more fatigue and cohesion affecting than a regular creek, like, uh, you know, like these over here. So that effectively prevents a flank attack. Or at least much more prohibitively than something like Forest or Small Creeks does. And so that's kind of a, a hard anchor. And then best of all would be something like these bays over here or a big river like the Tennessee River or the Mississippi River. You know, that would be about as hard an anchor as you could get. Theoretically, something like a, a vertical cliff would do the same thing. Uh, there really aren't many of those on any of the maps in this game. None that I've ever seen. Maybe there's some obscure, like, West Virginia map that has something like that. But I don't recall ever seeing something like that. So over here, in front of the objective, facing this direction, I don't have any of that. You know, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm kind of in a situation facing this direction down this road where, eh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have flanks hanging out in the air in open ground. So I'll have to come up with something. So that's my initial thoughts on this battle. And I'm going to put a, a cut in here for a little while while I set up those positions. And I will be back. Okay, I've set the position up uh, as discussed before the cut. And as I mentioned, I've got Cav over here very close, and they're going to grab this point um, immediately, and hopefully soon enough where Fremont cannot come in here. Then Cav is going to come up this road to try to eliminate, you know, confirm or com to confirm whether or not uh, who is it? Halleck will be coming from this direction. And if we don't see him by the time we get up to, say, around these woods uh, at the Parks Place on Mason Hill, then that would indicate that he is coming from the northeastern uh, direction. So what I did with the defensive position. If Halleck comes this way, there's two uh, not fords, but bridges crossing the river here close to our objective point. There is also a track through these woods, so I, I need to keep an eye on that as well. I think I'm probably going to uh, 
detach some skirmishers and move them up pretty far up in here somewhere just for vision on that as soon as I start time rolling. But for now, I've got, uh, I think this is Reigns here. No, Pierce. This is uh, Allegheny Johnson's old division. He moved over to Western Virginia. And of the two brigade commanders, Pierce, they're both pretty good, Cheatham and Pierce, but Pierce was a little bit better. And so I promoted him to the divisional command, and his old brigade is now commanded by Patrick Claiborne. He's a volunteer, I think he's a volunteer officer, but he's an Arkansas guy and these are Arkansas troops, so that worked out. He's, he's pretty good. So I've got uh, Pierce's division here guarding this bridge with a fence and a little breastwork. And I've got Rhodes's division on this bridge with a fence and a breastwork. And the horse artillery battalions for these two divisions I put the I detached them so they won't move with their infantry but I, I put them together here in the middle their front is protected by the river and they can fire all the way across here in either direction so that's this side on the other side uh, I decided to go ahead and set up behind the objective, which means that the Federals could take it, but only they can only take it by already making an attack. You know, it's within range, especially when we'll put skirmishers out here. We'll put Posey's skirms on this fence line. Canty will have some skirms out here. So they can take the objective, but they can't take it without fighting. And here's where I use most of my engineering points, put up some parapets, and uh, I put them back a little bit for two reasons. Number one, it's just a shorter distance. And so we'll have less order delay, and if I need to flex troops from one side to the other, uh, they have a shorter distance to go. And so two brigades in the parapets, one on either side. And then Waitman's brigade is kind of back here, sort of in reserve, but not... His purpose is, if the Federals come this way onto this position, the AI does like to... They won't, I don't think, sometimes they will, but a lot of times they won't just pound directly into the center of a fortified position. That They will work around to one side or the other and uh, try to hit a flank, load up a flank. And so Waitman is here to flex to whichever side that's going to be. And I angled the parapets back to kind of, you know, refuse the flanks a little bit. And so Waitman's either going to go here or here, depending on how the battle develops. If the Federals come this way at all, which is not guaranteed. And then I've got uh, the divisional artillery, or the core artillery, rather. Uh, Huger's artillery division. Right now, I just have them limbered up in between so that these battalions can move to either side depending upon where it looks like they are most needed and they may not stay as a uh, cohesive force you know one battery may go on this side and one bat battery may go on that side there are two armies it is entirely possible that we will be fighting on both fronts Moving right into the field of fire of Johnson's skirmishers. That's fine. Keep on coming. And there we go. Hopefully we can get a cheap little uh, routing of a battalion or two over here. Before they break. So he's a little far away from his brigade, so he's got a cut off morale uh, debuff. That's another good reason not to let the skirmishers go too far away from their parent brigades. Okay. 
No, fire at the wavering guy. There we go. Some pretty small brigades over here, too. It's a thousand man cav brigade. 500 in that infantry brigade. That bodes well. They should be a little bit easier to route. Let's go ahead and put uh, these two brigades in the fence and on the breastwork or in the breastwork and on the fence <laughs> just for cover in case they take some artillery fire that's really the only reason I'm doing this and I yeah I left their skirmishers over here I think Cheatham and uh, Claiborne can tell their skirmishers to come back that'll take a while Kind of looks like the Federals aren't going to come down this way. Well, that was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. I could have told those skirmishers to come up here and work on this artillery, too. That horse artillery did break. Skirms haven't, have only taken one casualty. Okay, looks like they've stopped for the moment and have gone into line facing east. Let's come up a little closer, make sure we keep tabs on them. I don't know if a halt order works for... It does, okay, yeah. Instantaneously, too. They don't have to wait. Alright. Come help these skirms with this artillery over here. These other skirms. Get three skirm skirmisher uh, detachments. Scrums are really good for dealing with unsupported uh, artillery. This has already been demonstrated. We've already routed one just with a, some picket fire. Don't really need these skirmishers engaging. They're mainly for vision. Oh, they are waiting for orders. The halt order was instantaneous, but the order to move up to that spot apparently is not. Now, when you see this icon, if it's red, it means feud, but there's a red and a white version, and I'm not 100% sure what the difference is. I guess red means, I guess white means prone to feud, and red maybe means is actually doing something contrary to his orders. I, I, that's a guess. But it appears that Claiborne is a... And now it's gone red. 
And that's not Claiborne feuding with, uh, who would that be? Pierce. That's Claiborne's own skirmishers feuding with him, I suppose. That's what it looks like. Okay. Fremont just sitting on his butt up here. That's fine. And I thought that these... I thought I had ordered these skirms back. Come on, get over here. No, he's engaged now. He's just... okay. <laughs> these guys are just going to fight it out till they break. That's about all there is to it. Alright, screw it. Just pull the skirmishers in. If they're not going to be responsive, maybe the, the next set will be. Okay, this, cat, this artillery is not unsupported anymore. <laughs> We've got infantry moving on uh, Johnson's skirmishers. Okay, well that all slows the Federals down. Bushrod Johnson actually working on these breastworks? Yeah. Took a sweet time to start, though. Clark's already done with his. Those pickets are going to be quickly overwhelmed. Not so far, though. He's hasn't taken many losses yet. I wonder if he'll acknowledge just a short movement order to fall back a little bit. Part of the issue is he's outside the command radius of his uh, of his parent. So he can't get fallback or advance orders. He's spreading fire around among several brigades, though. Fremont just staying put. These guys aren't quite in line of sight, but as soon as they come around and try to cross this uh, river, our artillery should be able to open up on them. Let's go ahead and unlimber that artillery, see what his line of sight arc looks like. far as skirms have given better than they've received. Okay, these these pickets have been uh, driven back. And let's go ahead and put some pickets out from Pierce's division. Raymond's not doing anything. Great. Federals have actually increased in morale a little bit. I guess because they forced a route of that skirm unit. That's probably why. Uh... 
So Clark built his breastwork, but he kind of manned them a little weird. I think we have time to kind of correct that. Same thing with Bushrod Johnson, who stopped working on his breastworks. These skirms are moving right across this river, so I guess it is passable terrain. Okay, I thought these skirm there he is. He's in cover. These folks seem kind of dithering there a little bit. All right, now let's see if we can get Johnson actually okay constructing. Earlier he had an entrenchment order, and then it got cleared by the other entrenchment plan and then I had to draw this again. I think that kind of messed Johnson's brigade up for orders in the game. Maybe. Clark did take a little bit of loss resilience here, and that wasn't him, that was his skirmisher. So the skirmisher uh, losses do affect the parent brigade. Not much, but some. At least if they route. It would appear. Okay, we've got a skirmishers in cover up here, but they're not quite close enough to fire on any of that artillery. And they're close enough, I don't know if, if, if I ordered th these pickets up to this fence line, I don't know if they would actually get there. I think they would just move into this orchard. And once within engagement range, which he is kind of right now with this brigade, I think he would just stop and shoot. Right now they're, they're just taking artillery fire, so I'm going to tell him to lay down. Fremont's moving again. <clears throat> Losing a little bit of vision on what's going on up here. So have Clark put out a few more skirms. I'm not going to send them very far. Just extend our fog of war a tiny bit.
there's kind of a low ridge right through here. I think I'm going to put the calf here. He should be able to see this way and that way. Halleck and Fremont are not pressing very hard on our position. They're letting themselves get stymied by a few picket detachments. Speed up time a little bit here. Okay, this Federal Brigade is pushing in on our pickets who are retreating. Just pulling back a little bit off the fence, which didn't necessarily want. Although I guess he had to, would have been just melee, if, so I guess that's what he's supposed to do. Is he still laying down? He is not. He is engaging. These guys are still laying down. Also getting flanked. Let's see if we can turn their orientation without losing cover. I don't know if they can or not. No, lost his cover, but he's helping out now. I think these forces are just forming up to come straight ahead across the creek instead of crossing at the ford and coming this way. And that is going to play hell with their cohesion and uh, fatigue. I'm just going to edge this artillery a little bit this way. Try to get all of these batteries with good fields of fire. And it looks like right now their LOS is being affected by this skirmisher unit. I wonder if that will change if I lay them down. Doesn't look like it. As soon as they come across this creek, I'll pull these skirmishers back and maybe that will give the artillery a better look through here. They are able to hit this calf as it is. And it doesn't look like he's within the artillery line of sight. So that's another case of artillery's a little weird. <laughs> it's hard to predict what they can and cannot shoot. Does this guy have any targets? He's firing at something. He's so great. Okay, th these pickets have been pushed back. The brigade has taken 250 casualties just from pickets. Great. Alright. Well, you had one set of skirmishers pushed back. Send out some more. There you go.
What's happening over here? Nothing fast. And they formed up in line, stationary again, facing east. I think that's great for now. I am going to go ahead and bring Waitman over here. No, that's not what I wanted. I'll just Waitman. Click the wrong one. There we go. Okay, is Johnson going to get his breastwork done in time here? Firing, firing, soon we'll be firing. And firing. I don't know if, probably won't pull back in time to avoid breaking. Maybe. He's not even wavering. Full resilience loss. All kinds of negative morale modifiers. But not even wavering. Good job. Clayburn. Nope, there he goes. <laughs> Just as I was bragging on you. Fremont stationary. How are these guys doing? Okay. Clark's pickets are doing okay so far. Come on, Johnson. You're taking forever, bro, with these breastworks. Alright. Whatever. It's, he's got some kind of partial cover in here. Breastwork uh, credit. A little bit of movement over here. Who is this? Oh, Waitman has... He had skirms out. That's just... His skirmishers moving ahead of him. I don't remember him... I don't remember ordering him to put out skirms. Let's move this... Let's move this battery over here. I don't think he's getting shots right now. Johnson doesn't have any cover. And Johnson himself has been wounded. That sucks. He's a pretty good commander. At the brigade level. These guys in canister range. Not 
quite. Try to move that battery up close enough for canister. Let's move Hugo a little bit closer to his battalions. And let's move Waitman's got Mississippi rifles. Let's get him over here on the other flank of the artillery. Deliver some flanking fire from range with the Mississippis. Let's get his skirmishers out. Doing the same. Let's move Reigns over closer to Waitman. And I'm going to have Posey pull his skirmishers in and prepare to move. Rose's division's gonna need some help here. Rhodes is wounded. Ah. Okay. I'm just gonna have to put Stark right up here. I think that this breastwork somehow, even though it's not built, is blocking its LOS. Okay, come up here and do the canister thing. Here comes Fremont. Oh, Waveman doesn't get caught from behind. Calf brigade broken, that's good. Okay. Stark's battalion should be delivering some canister on this guy. He's well within range. I hope he is. Wishrod's uh, brigade. It is in cover. I think that was obscured before by uh, the Rhodes icon. Let's pull Rhodes back. Or <laughs> Rhodes' staff back just a little bit. There's still a staff there. There's a staff officer still exercising command of the uh, division. I thought I'd put everybody on long range. Waitman's on medium. Are these guys all on long range? Yes. Yes.
Yes. Okay. Okay, so this attack appears to have been kind of beaten off. Sort of. Let's go ahead and get steel behind the line. And I think... I think we better get Waitman back in here as well. Before he gets caught in a kind of a compromising situation. Got this one little brigade trying to get to that artillery. He's wavering, he's taking 50% losses. Okay, casualty ratio is heavily in our favor. Who is this? Okay, unlimber this artillery. Yeah, right up in, and that's fine, right there. Somehow, Waitman is getting credit for cover in the parapet. He's not actually moving, though. That seems problematic. Great. Um, let's reorient this. Get Posey back oriented in this direction as well. No, get into the parapet, please. His orders are bugging out. It's seeing. Yeah, cover nut. There he goes. Okay. Let's just get uh, some skirmishers back out here to keep these guys under fire. Okay, Claiborne is feuding with Pierce, apparently. Well, I may have moved Cheatham too early. Looks like these guys are headed down this way. So this threat has dissipated. Let's halt uh, Cheatham. And then I'm going to bring it back down to these breastworks. See what these guys are up to. Put out some skirms. Can only move like a foot. The guy's wavering already. So these two battalions are still firing on these on these forces. 
is fine. But they should rotate to face these guys at some point. I thought these guys were broken up. They're not quite convinced yet. Marmaduke up here, closer to his subordinates. Not that I ever give army level orders. Waitman finally getting into the parapets. Cheat him getting back in his breastworks. Cross from these guys. That's working out fine. Okay, brigade here, brigade here, brigade here. Kind of in reserve. Okay, I think we're in a good position to meet whatever Fremont does over here. I think. This artillery is now engaged. Firing in here. Items in cover. Firing at somebody. Oh, these guys. Second brigade. Under pain. Pain is right. Keep coming. Probably turning into a pretty long episode. <laughs> oh, end of day. Okay. Okay, I wound up having to do a little bit more fiddling than I thought. Uh, when I first placed this entrenchment line at the beginning of the battle, I did not recognize, and I even made a, a comment earlier in the episode about how some of these elevated positions don't look all that big whenever you actually look at the terrain. However, in this particular case, there's an elevated spot right here, which is actually fairly high. In basically, it, and the entrenchment is facing right here into it. And uh, I so initially I was going to uh, just kind of hold the positions I had, but there's a big blind spot here, and I had Waitman's uh, brigade with Mississippi rifles, and because of this hill, he could shoot about as far as this darn tree right here. <laughs> So, and I'm like, oh, that's bad. And that's, an, and that's a reason why, you know, I kind of moved artillery batteries right in this location. And they weren't firing on these advancing uh, guys in Fremont's. Could, they couldn't see them. So, I had enough engineering points. I just, so I'm pulling this position back. And I just drew a straight uh, trench right across here. Abandoned this section of the line. And so Reigns' division, you, it's weird, you can move brigades and battalions during the intermediate de overnight deployment phases, but you can't move commanders. <laughs> so that's where Reigns was. 
and uh, he's under orders to move here. So his division is here holding this side near the objectives. Near the objective, which they will probably take. But this is their initial position. I'm kind of thinking at some point, uh, Canty and, and uh, the Cav back here, when the time looks right, may kind of wheel across here and flank. And I've already got uh, this horse artillery battery uh, looking at this as well. Here's Waitman here. I've got Huger's uh, battalions right here in the trench line. I'm thinking that they're going to come across this hill and we've got a little bit more range right in here than we would have if I had maintained the original parapet. Rhodes's two brigades, which have been the two most heavily engaged thus far, are on this end of the new trench 90 degree angle that that could be a weakness but well we'll just have to see the how they deploy and i left uh, pierce's division just basically right where they are uh, facing this crossing and i positioned this uh, horse artillery battalion right between them hopefully to deliver some canister fire uh, within canister range of this bridge So that's kind of our little Alamo position there. And let's see what the Federals do. Get time rolling. Oh, they didn't change. Okay, right. <laughs> I kind of thought they might redeploy. Well, that's good. They are taking the uh, objective point. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Let's move these skirms up a little bit. Pretty happy with this defensive setup over here. Let's just look at driven back here. I think. Got a little bit of an assault going on here, but low cohesion. They have to cross water. Cheatham is in cover. That's. I don't think that's going to work out. Cav Brigade here in the middle with an infantry brigade behind them. Surely Rose's division can handle that. Can't be. Go ahead and pull your skirms back in before they break. this cab up over here. Let's get Cam. 
ante in a flanking position without obscuring that artillery's uh, line of sight. Hopefully. I, mean, I know they're just six pounders, but these guys are still walking right into uh, a lot of arty. Hancock's cavalry is wavering and retreating. Second brigade isn't very large. I don't see him sticking. How's Pierce doing? They're doing fine. Yeah. It's close enough that sh there should be some canister fire going in into this brigade from uh, this horse artillery. This brigade is broken. This brigade is just kind of hanging out. <laughs> I, I probably could have maintained that line over here. This is working out fine, too. Dismount. It's edge canty up just enough to. Okay, we can fire from there. Let's get the cab in loose order. I don't know if that'll be close enough for the burn sites to have range. Well, that's a weird path. He wants to he wants to go all the way up here before coming back to this position. That's no good. Do a halt. Let's come out here more open. Well, okay, that's better. Okay, they're retreating across the board, it looks like. Okay, let's go ahead and start advancing, guys. Keep them under fire as long as we can. Major Confederate, I know that was a long episode, even with the cuts I'm going to put in, but Major Confederate victory, we did lose uh, almost 1,300 men, only lost one gun, not much cav, 1,200 uh, infantry, I think that was mostly in uh, Rhodes' division, and 5,500 for the Federals across two armies. Okay. I think that is the fifth Battle of St. Louis. There's another one point of Union National Morale hit. Our experience rises some more. And there we go. Marmaduke had a little bit of a fame problem earlier. Looks like that is correcting itself quickly now that he is in Corps Command.
one thing I'd noticed about Marmaduke when I was reading about him, I forgot to mention earlier, at one point in the middle of the war, uh, he actually fought a duel with another Confederate general whose name escapes me at the moment. I think it was Lucius Daniels? That might not quite be right. Lucius something. I think it was Lucius Daniels. And killed him. <laughs> uh, and apparently suffered no consequences. Uh, Sterling Price, I, I think, uh, brought him up on charges and he was facing a court-martial, but then there was an attack about to happen There was, and they kind of postponed it and then it just never happened. To be fair the other general had challenged him. I, I think Marmaduke said something disparaging about him, and, you know, my honor is offended, sir, and we shall duel pistols at dawn. Yeah, at that point, what are you going to do, right? So, uh, anyway, Marmaduke was the better shot. Maybe that guy should have thought twice. All right. And then one of the Yankee commanders got defamed. And I know that was a long episode. And uh, if you're still here, I appreciate it deeply. Thank you very much for watching.